So if you're coming from terzepidide and you're moving over to retrocytide, you can actually lower the dose quite significantly, saving you a boatload of cash in the process. Now, since there isn't much scientific evidence on retrocytide to go with yet, no direct head-on-head -head dosage comparisons between retrocytide and the other GLP-1 receptor agonists, let's compare its efficacy to the other GLP-1 receptor agonists, wherever the information is available, and come up with our own dosage ranges where the beneficial effects and potential side effects are observed. There are a few meta-analysis studies which compare the efficacy of retrocytide versus the efficacy of other GLP-1s, but they usually do that with the investigated clinical trial dosages at the maximum dose that they investigated regarding its efficacy on weight loss, not a particular dose of retrocytide versus the other GLPs, a certain amount of milligrams, for you to have an expected certain amount of weight loss. So I got to work and did it for you. Here are the effects of the various GLP-1s on body weight reduction and the various investigated dosages wherever I could find the results. Some of the studies didn't mention the baseline starting weight of the patients or participants. So instead of a percentage reduction, I listed the net kilograms or pounds lost. So this is just the raw data of GLP-1 receptor agonists regarding body weight reduction. The details are on the screen. Let that scroll a little bit. We'll use this for the calculations a little bit later on. Here's the raw data for the uh, glucagon receptor agonists regarding body fat reduction, wherever known, so that's already a lot less, just for liraglutide, semiglutide, and terzepidide. These percentages were known. Here are the results for GLP-1 receptor agonists regarding waist circumference reduction, um, shown in centimeters or inches. A little bit more information was available there. Let that scroll a little bit so you have the details on the screen. Then regarding a GLP-1 receptor agonist and liver fat reduction, whether that's relative liver fat reduction or absolute, liver fat reduction um, shown in a percentage. The details are on the screen, a lot of details, so let that scroll a little bit. Here are the GLP-1s regarding their total cholesterol reduction, uh, usually in milligrams per deciliter or millimoles per liter, but sometimes shown as a percentage. And then lastly, uh, the changes in hemoglobin A1c levels, uh, usually in a percentage, because hemoglobin A1c is also a percentage. Let that scroll a little bit. This is probably the most information I could find, because most of these glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists have been investigated in the context of type 2 diabetes, in which case they always check hemoglobin A1c levels and see how much they reduce over time. So with all of this raw data, let's calculate, albeit highly dubiously, but this is what we get to expect from these deep dives because nobody else did it, so I have to do it for you guys. Highly dubious calculation regarding the effects that you would be able to expect from three milligrams retrocytide weekly, whether you take that once weekly or three shots Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one milligram subcutaneous each, right? That's entirely up to you, um, which again is the commonly used dosage amongst the bodybuilders and everybody else in the fitness community nowadays. Three milligrams retrocyte weekly, split up one milligram Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That seems to be the sweet spot for most people using this particular compound. Uh, this is a range based on the average of all of the results uh, I just mentioned a little bit earlier. And the dosage range, which is closest to the results we're aiming for for each medication, without the range, we'd get some weird results. So there's a little bit of a range, but you should be able to get a similar effect as 3 milligrams retrocytide. So regarding body weight reduction, 3 milligrams retrocytide should give you a reduction of approximately 12.08%. And if you're after 12.08% body weight reduction, then you would need to get the following dosage ranges for the other GLP-1 receptor agonists. Regarding changes in body fat levels, that was unfortunately never assessed in humans. We can use that glucagon receptor agonist uh, for dubious extrapolation, but I think we do enough of that here already. We only know a body weight changes, not body fat changes for retrocytide, so we'll have to skip over this segment. So let's move over to the waist circumference reduction. If you go with three milligrams retrocytide weekly, you should expect a waist circumference reduction of approximately 10 centimeters or four inches and you would need to take these particular dosages of the other GLP-1 receptor agonists to get a comparable waist circumference reduction of approximately 10 centimeters or four inches. Uh, next is a comparison of three milligrams retrocytide weekly regarding relative liver fat reduction since the absolute liver fat reduction values aren't commonly reported. 
Three milligrams retrogutite should give you a relative liver fat reduction of 59.1%. And if you're after 59.1% with the other GLP-1 receptor agonists, then uh, the dosages are on the screen. For total cholesterol reduction, three milligrams retrogutite weekly should give you a total cholesterol reduction of about 5.2%. And the uh, dosages for the other GLP-1 receptor agonists for a similar total cholesterol reduction of about 5.2% are on the screen. Regarding hemoglobin A1C reduction, 3 milligrams retrotutide should give you a 0.88% reduction in hemoglobin A1C. And again, the dosages are on the screen if you're after a similar reduction. Now, if we want to compare all these beneficial effects of three milligrams retrotutide versus the other GLP-1 receptor agonists, three milligrams retrotutide equals, again, this is a very good approximation, three milligrams retrotutide weekly subcutaneously approximates about 4.2 micrograms exenatide orally daily or 6.4 milligrams exenatide orally weekly. So that's uh, micrograms versus milligrams, a big uh, discrepancy in dosing protocol. You have a uh, uh, short acting and log acting exenatide. Uh, 0.8 milligrams to 5.2 milligrams lyroglutide subcutaneously daily with a mean administration dose of 2.7 milligrams subcutaneously daily. 1.4 milligrams to 18.8 milligrams duloglutide subcutaneously weekly with a mean administration dose of 6.4 milligrams subcutaneous weekly. 1.7 milligrams to 3.1 milligrams semiglutide subcutaneous weekly with a mean administration dose of 2.3 milligrams subcutaneous weekly or 14.2 milligrams semiglutide orally daily. It's or orally, it's also bioavailable apparently. 47.6 milligrams abliglutide subcutaneous weekly, 42.3 micrograms lixisenatide subcutaneous weekly, 3.2 to 18.8 terzepatide subcutaneous weekly with a mean administration dose of 7.5 milligrams subcutaneous weekly. So 3 milligrams retrogutide versus 7.5 milligrams terzepatide on a weekly basis, that's about two and a half times. So if you're coming from terzepatide and you're moving over to retrogutide, you can actually lower the dose quite significantly, saving you a boatload of cash in the process. 1 to 4.1 milligrams servodutide with a mean administration dose of 2.4 milligrams subcutaneous weekly, 2.3 milligrams to 8.6 milligrams mastutide with a mean administration dose of 5.3 milligrams subcutaneous weekly, and 7.3 milligrams to 14.2 milligrams efenopegdutide uh, subcutaneous weekly with a mean administration dose of 8.9 milligrams subcutaneous weekly. And, uh, well, bioglutide would be uh, 158.4 milligrams orally, daily, all to get comparable effect as 3 milligrams retrogutide subcutaneous weekly, preferably split up into 1 milligram shots Monday, Wednesday, Friday. These calculations took a bot lot of time. I'm sure I made a mistake here and there. So my sincere apologies if I messed up, um, but this is the best we can do. The scientific evidence doesn't go this in depth. So again, I did it for you. And if you have some anecdotal experience and blood work results before and after switching from exenatite to retrotutite or lyrglutite to retrotutite, dula to reta, sema to reta, terzepidite to retrotutite, please let us know down below in the comment section were your blood work results similar for particular dosage ranges? And how was the switch going from one compound to rich to tight regarding dosage and overall satiation, fat loss and beneficial effects? Or did you get full-blown cardiac arrhythmias and your resting heart rate went up with 12 points as was shown in the clinical trials, right? Let us know your experience down below because not many people made the switch and really documented it. I mean, I've never done that myself either. I either used lyroglutide for a couple months, then came off and got fat again, or used terzepidite for a couple months, came off and got fat again. And now, uh, nowadays I use retrogutide, but I never switch from lyra to reta or terzepidite to retrogutide. So if you have some experience on that front, let us know down below in the comment section. We would all love to hear about it.